Okay. So we have the recording going. We're rolling. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for being with me tonight. This is our third class session of uh, automotive scanners. And tonight we're going to jump into uh, all the different modes of OBD2. We talked about um, uh, three or four of them a couple of weeks ago. We're going we're gonna to go through all the different modes and maybe get into some diagnostics as well. I'm also going to um, review some of the uh, like assignments that are coming up in the class and maybe some of the ones that we, we just did, uh, just so that you guys um, know what what we've done and where we're going and, and hopefully answer any questions you might have. But let's jump into our topic tonight first, and that is getting into all those different modes of OBD2. So I'm going to change my screen share back to my presentation and we'll get into it. So I said, maximizing your generic scan tool. Remember that in this class, our focus really, uh, initially when I first wrote the curriculum, it was all about the snap-on scanner. But um, when we decided to make it go online, we, we decided to kind of change the focus and say, hey, let's do, what can we do with a generic inexpensive scanner? And if we can get you guys really maximizing all these different modes of OBD2, uh, you're gonna be so much further ahead. And then if you jump on a scanner that has some more features like a snap-on or um, an all tell or even a factory scanner, you're gonna be that much further ahead. And some of the mistakes that I've seen over and over are related to folks just not knowing the basics of OBD2 and how the computer is gonna to respond to certain things. So that's what we're gonna be looking at is all these different modes, all nine of these modes. And actually I have a, uh, they've added modes since this screenshot here. Uh, so we're gonna be going into all the different modes of our scan tool here tonight. So let's do just that. I'll clear off the scribbles. Now, last class, I introduced you guys to an eight step diagnostic process. And it is not the end all of all diagnostic uh, procedures, but I wanted to give you guys something that was a, a basic routine that you could go through for um, uh, scanner diagnostics to get you go in the right direction. What I mean is that each one of you is gonna eventually kind of develop your own diagnostic process, if you will, but uh, you need something to start off with. And too many times do I see people, they like pull codes and they just start throwing parts at their car based on whatever codes they pull. So our eight step process uh, was one to verify the complaint. And if we're doing scanner diagnostics on OBD2 vehicles, right? Vehicles 96 and newer, that typically means the mill or check engine light is on, right? So that's pretty easy to look in there. Hey, is the check engine light on? We pull the codes, we always write down. So when I say record, I, that means write those down. So we always write down all of our, our codes, our freeze frame data. Then we start to look at our scan data, our PIDs, our parameters uh, to see if they match and support that uh, freeze frame data. And of course, right about this time, we gotta start doing some research. We can't know everything in our head. So we have to be able to look up service information. So we have that And steps four and five, as I said last class, sometimes I might do step five here first before four, depending upon how familiar I am with the vehicle or not familiar with the vehicle. Um, so those might switch back and forth, but I'm gonna review my service information. I'm gonna put over here on the side, TSBs, technical service bulletins. The idea is that you are likely not the first technician, the first person to have this particular problem with this vehicle. And if there's been enough people with the same problem, the manufacturer has likely identified the issue and put out a technical service bulletin to let you know what the problem is to kind of give you a shortcut. So I always, when I'm reviewing my service information, I'm gonna pull those TSBs to see if there's anything that applies to the problem that I'm facing. Um, I have up here, hey, the scan tool, it does not replace 
of having a good multimeter or using a lab scope. The scan tool works in conjunction with these pinpoint tools. And so that's why step six is, now I gotta break out my meters or my scopes and actually pinpoint exactly what the problem is and pinpoint it down and figure it out, right? Once I've really done my diagnosis, now I can do my repairs, right? And then what's really important is when we're all done, we got to verify those repairs because, hey, sometimes we get it wrong and we don't want to give that car back to the customer and the problem still be there. And this is a step that I see too many shops skip and they give the car back to the customer. It still has a problem and stuff unravels from there. All right. So. We introduce you to that process. I'm gonna, of course, show it to you again throughout the class. Um, here's another screen we looked at. We talked about front door and back door. Front door is the raw data coming in that you measure with your multimeter or oscilloscope. The back door represents your scan data, your processed information. And just so that we understand that, hey, processed information, there's always the possibility that something gets messed up. For example, right, the data has to come from the sensors, it has to go to the computer and the computer has to send it out to our scanner and it's got to display it properly on its screen. So if our scanner's not communicating right, if uh, maybe there's a wiring issue between that particular sensor and the engine uh, or in the computer, um, or we could have the computer operating in some sort of default running strategy like a limp mode all those things could throw off what we see on the scanner and so that's why i always make the warning that hey this is processed information sometimes it can lie to you and we'll talk a little bit more about that all right moving right along then so a good analogy to separate out a scanner, whether you're using a, a, a professional scan tool, one of our inexpensive interfaces, ELM interfaces, to compare that to a multimeter would be is a scanner is a directional tool. A scanner gets you close. It's like your compass, okay? Now, sometimes I can get exactly where I'm going with my scanner. But most of the time, the scanner is going to get me close. And if I really want to pinpoint exactly what's wrong, right, I want to do the, the GPS, I want to know exactly where I'm at, that's where having the multimeter or the oscilloscope really uh, comes into play. So that's how, that's how I kind of relate those two things. So one doesn't replace the other. You really end up using them both together. Sometimes I can get the job done with just my scanner if I have a lot of circuit knowledge and experience with that particular vehicle. Most of the time, I'm going to have to do those pinpoint tests with my meter or with my oscilloscope. So again, here I have a particular sensor. This would be a uh, optical. This would be an optical crankshaft sensor. Um, GM ran these in the 90s on, on their OptiSpark uh, engines. So you found those on Camaros and Corvettes and all kinds of things. Uh, Nissan ran these in their distributors for a lot of years. But basically, it gave us a really high resolution signal to the computer of where the engine was at in all 360 degrees of its rotation. Um, that's front door information. That's raw data going into the computer. The computer then processes that, sends it out to your scanner as what's the RPM revolutions per minute of the crankshaft. Okay, so to give you an example of front door versus back door. So if I put my oscilloscope on this sensor, it would be producing a signal that looked like that, front door. What do I see on my scanner? Not something that looks like that. I just have an RPM reading there. All right, we'll clear those drawings out and we'll keep going. So then the next layer to this is now we realize, hey, that, you know, scan tools versus scopes and meters, like they're, they're different tools for different jobs. 
um, all kind of helping us figure out what's wrong with the car, right? But then you start just looking at scan tools and there's a lot of little differences there. So in our class, I basically told you guys, hey, you know, use whatever scanner you want as long as it can get generic OBD2 information. And so I know I have some students that have a, um, they have a kind of professional scan tools. I have one student with an Altel. I have another student with, um, with a Snap-on scanner, um, you know, and uh, a few other folks with kind of in between, uh, like semi-professional stuff. And that's, um, that's great. However, a lot of you guys are probably just using this, um, this basic little um, scan tool interface that I, that I got for the college, an, EL, an ELM 327. And then you could be using this one, or this kind of looks like our uh, Vicar one, but all these basically work with a cell phone or a tablet. And again, they give us a pretty nice little OBD2 generic scanner. Now, what's the difference between an OBD2 generic scanner and a manufacturer specific? Or another way I, I should put that is a um, factory scanner. So for instance, right, what I have right here is the Toyota I think they spell it all, all one word. Toyota TechStream. Um, one of you guys posted about using the Tech2 scanner. That's GM's factory scanner from a few years ago. Um, so what's the difference? Well, uh, one, one of our little generic interfaces, it's just giving you this generic OBD2 information. So it's going to give you the modes that we are going to go over tonight that data that it gives you and information is gonna largely be emissions focused because remember that the goal of OBD2 is to monitor the emissions over the life of the vehicle. So it's, it's gonna be limited. It's gonna give you P0 codes and it will give you those code definitions. But if you have manufacturer specific codes like P1 codes, it'll tell you what the code is or it will give you the code number, I should say, but it won't tell you necessarily what that code number means on that car, because that's specific to that manufacturer. It'll show you what all the monitors are doing. Um, here's a real big thing to me though. Part of the OBD2 regulations are, is the scanner is not supposed to lie to you. So for example, I'm using my little ELM327 interface. And if I were to unplug the coolant temperature sensor on my vehicle, it would show me data that probably would say something like negative 40 degrees, you know, below zero on the Fahrenheit scale, something like that. Really, really, really cold. A lot of times I'm using a factory scanner. I unplug the coolant temperature sensor for a demonstration and the factory scanner doesn't say negative 40 degrees. It'll say, you know, 160 or 150. Because what will happen is the computer will see that I unplug the sensor. It will produce a default value of 160 degrees because it knows, hey, I've ran five minutes. I can't be negative. I can't go from 200 degrees to negative 40. I got to at least be, you know, one over 150. And so it defaults to 160. And that's what it shows you on the scanner screen. So sometimes the factory tool, although they have a lot more capabilities and they can program and stuff, once you're outside the realm of OBD2 and its rules and regulations, the scanner, the factory scanner, it can lie to you, okay? But an OBD2 generic scanner is not supposed to lie to you and that's per the regulations. All right, let's clear out those drawings. So we got factory scanners versus OBD2 generic scanners. Well, what about professional scanners? So here's the Snap-on Solus Ultra. And remember that in our class, you guys have the option of doing some of the Solus training and getting certified on this Solus Ultra scan tool here. You can get Snap-on certified on this thing. And, and now that campus is open, 
if you guys want to come to come to school like on a Friday or I can set up another time to have you come to school and check out one of these scanners and then work on it at the college and just get familiar with it. And I have all the snap on training loaded on our canvas site for you. Um, you can get certified in the scanner and this is not a factory scanner. It's not a dealer scanner. It's what we call a professional scanner, right? So if you were to buy this new, it would cost you somewhere between, let's say 3000 to maybe, you know, uh, around 4,000, maybe four and a half thousand dollars. Um, and it can do more things, a lot more things than our uh, little ELM 327 scanner can. It can do a lot more than this. Um, what it has in it, if I can get my clicker going here, is it has this scanner icon here. And that icon makes this uh, that mode of the scanner by clicking that icon, it goes into a mode where it tries to simulate the factory scan tool. Okay, so that would be the manufacturer side. That would be the manufacturer side where they simulate the uh, factory tool. This other icon. Here, well, this is where the snap-on would act as a generic OBD2 scanner from that icon right there. And it even says that OBD2, EOBD2, that's where it's basically turned the snap-on scanner into our ELM327 interface, if you will. And honestly, when I'm using this particular tool, I'll go back and forth between both modes um, because sometimes I want the power of the 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 factory side. I want to do some bi-directional controls or whatever, but there's other times where I just want that OBD2 generic data and I want to make sure the scanner's not lying to me. So I still use this generic side of the professional tool quite a bit. So this would be a professional tool. Um, a If I go back a slide, This would be this text stream is an example of your uh, factory tool, and most of all the factory tools these days are all PC based, and it's a PC with a computer interface, and you have to buy a subscription from the manufacturer, and that subscription can range anywhere from fifty dollars for one day of access to, you know, over you know, several hundred or thousands of dollars for a year. Um, but most all the factory tools, it's a computer with an interface and software that you load, you download directly from the manufacturer these days. The downside of these is each year, like the Toyota one, and we have six of these of when we've renewed all the subscriptions at the college. Um, I want to say it's about $1,200 a year for each tool. So if I don't renew the subscription, all of a sudden the tool times out and it doesn't work. So it's like a paperweight essentially uh, and won't scan anything uh, until I renew that subscription. And every manufacturer tool is some variation on that theme. It has a subscription, you have to pay, pay to renew it in order to make the tool work. All right. So now we know about the different types of tools, both professional, our, our little interface is more of like a do-it-yourselfer type tool uh, and generic versus manufacturer specific. So one more slide on that. Um, on the OEM side, right, this would be the, I'm going to say dealer. Oops. Spell that right. So he does a lot of stuff but it's whatever the manufacturer wants me to do. The generic OBD2 is, hey, I'm, I'm conforming to the federal regulations. And like I said, I'll use both sides oftentimes to help me diagnose the car. Okay, so really tonight's point is, is all about all the different generic modes that you should find in a generic scanner. And uh, we've actually talked about some of these modes already. 
uh, our presentation from a few weeks ago, we, we focused on modes one through four, where we uh, pulled codes. We looked at freeze frame data. We looked at our live data and our monitors. Um, when we were done with our repairs, we cleared all those codes. And then the other thing that we did is uh, after we did our test drive, I said, hey, always check for pending codes again. So last time we actually went through modes one through four and we also tiptoed around a little bit in mode seven there. Okay, well tonight we're gonna get into all the other modes. I think most everybody understands, hey, codes, I can pull codes, all right? So that's, that's this one right here, pull the codes and, uh, you know, look at data. In fact, you know, we've been able to do this a long time. In fact, uh, I, was, I was working on a couple old GM vehicles earlier this week. One of those was a 1984. And guess what? On that 1984, I could get codes and data. Of course, GM was way ahead of the game. GM had codes and data on some of their cars as early as midway through 1981. Um, but we've had codes and data for a long time. What came on board with OBD2, of course, is now freeze frame data, having that, that snapshot of what was going on in the car when the code was set, having these monitors where the car is actively testing different components on the car, and having type A and type B codes so you can set a pending code. Those were all, all new things. Well, we need to talk about those a little bit more, but we also need to look at, well, what's all these other modes and how, how do they work and what's going on there? So again, pulling codes and data, I think is something that most everybody gets to do. A lot of people forget to look at the freeze frame. We always wanna check out what that freeze frame was and record or save all that information, right? And it's so easy to do with our cell phone based tools because you can just easily take a screenshot of your cell phone, right? So um, what I'm trying to get you guys to stay clear from is, oh, I pulled some codes. Oh, I'm just gonna replace those parts or I pulled some codes, I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna clear these codes um, and, and see what happens. Remember that when you clear the codes, you reset all the monitors. And sometimes it can take a long time for the computer to test itself out again, because remember it has to meet enable criteria. And one of our, our I think our first class, we talked quite a bit about enable criteria, those conditions necessary to get the car to um, test itself. All right, so just a couple of tips and, and most of this stuff we already kind of uh, already kind of went over. Um, uh, the global or generic OBD2 data is the raw data and it's not supposed to be manipulated or changed in any ways. So it's always good to check the global OBD2 data first before you go into the manufacturer mode. And there's another note on substituted values. Like if I'm in the dealer side of the tool, the VIN specific side is what Snap-on calls it. Uh, then you can uh, get some get some false data. So just one more reminder on that false data thing. All right. So I got my generic scan tool here. Um, I think this is like one that you could get from the auto parts store. They used, used to sell that at maybe Harbor Freight. So it's kind of a do it yourself or one, um, not cell phone based, but, um, and the question is, well, what, what modes of OBD2 am I going to get? Well, the answer is it depends because not all cars and all to tools will give you all 10 modes these days. And yes, today there's not just uh, nine modes. Nowadays, there's 10 modes here. So this zero A hex for, for 10, that's my mode 10, if you will. Um, so not all cars will, will support that, right? Maybe the computer on the car isn't new enough or smart enough to give you all, all those modes, or maybe your limiting function is the tool. So it really depends. Um, if you use the scanner app um, that I recommended in our class, 
the one that I'm basing a lot of our slides off of, it'll do most all the modes. The only one I haven't had it do is number eight right here. And that's on a late model car that has a smart enough computer to handle all those modes. All right. So again, eight step diagnostic process. When we did that process together, we did modes one through four. We verified the complaint. Hey, the mill was on. We pulled the codes. So that would have been um, reading the, uh, reading the fault codes. So that would have been, here's a uh, mode, mode three. We looked at the, we looked at the freeze frame information here. We looked at the scan data, right? We reviewed ser service information, all that type of stuff. But when we verified repairs, we did that mode seven, looking for pending codes after our test drive. And on our test drive, we, we made sure to meet the enable criteria. What's my tip to meet the enable criteria? Well, remember my freeze frame. I want to say it's close to the enable criteria. It may not be perfect, but it usually gets you in the ballpark. So if it set the code and you were driving at, you know, quarter throttle at 30% load at 50 miles an hour with a warmed up engine, you know, it's, it's a short guess that those are the same conditions that you'll need to get that monitor to run again. All right. So we, we, did, we did those ones. So now let's look at some of these other ones. Okay. Oh, wait, before we do that, where are these modes on our car scanner app? Now, keep in mind this, you know, this isn't necessarily a professional app. But it's a good do-it-yourselfer app. And what I liked about it is for the purpose of our class, it had the majority of the modes. It works the same on both an Android phone or an iPhone. My daughter left her phone up there. All right. Um, it's got the, the vast majority of all the, um, the modes that we want for OBD2. And, it, and it's a, a good little tool. And I think even if you have a professional scan tool, this thing is a good little backup. If your professional tool's not working or you're going on a road trip and you don't wanna lug your $2,000 scan tool in your car, this is a great little tool to have in your glove box all the time. So um, where are these different modes on this particular app, which again, uses an ELM interface? Okay, so. Mode one, well, that's gonna be right there. I'm looking for live data and all the monitors. If I clicked that icon, all sensors, it would give me that mode one. All right, what about uh, mode, uh, mode two, the freeze frame data? Well, boom, that's right in the center. It looks like a little floppy disk, which I always think is kind of funny because uh, like who uses a floppy disk on their computer anymore to save anything? I don't know anybody that, that does. I have some laying around here, and my junk in the garage, but not the average person. But anyways, that's your freeze frame. So there's mode two, right in the middle of the tool. What about, um, uh, well, I got a little thing here. What about on mode five? Mode five would be over here and Mode four, how do I pull my codes and clear my codes and all that stuff? Um, that's right there under the thing that says diagnostic trouble codes. And it looks like the little check engine. So that, that does a bunch of stuff right there. Okay, so again, my mode five, uh, my mode seven, my pending codes are actually under the same diagnostic trouble code heading. What you will not find on this app, or I haven't found it yet on the latest update that I have, is I don't see where it does request of onboard control systems. None of these icons that I've seen have allowed me to control like the EVAP system on the car. So that's the one it does not do. That's a bi-directional control. In fact, let me type that up there. 
Um, mode eight would be a good example of bi-directional. where we're using the scan tool to, to control the vehicle's computer system a certain way. So maybe I could raise and lower the idle speed, turn on the EGR valve. The most common one for OBD2 is to control the canister vent solenoids so that you can look for EVAP leaks. This tool does not do that. At least it doesn't do it on the, on the versions that I have. What about mode nine? Well, this tool should do mode nine. In fact, a lot of you guys, oops, let me go back a slide. A lot of you guys have, have already done that. Uh, on one of our first assignments, I said, hey, give me your, your vehicle um, protocol. Well, this mode nine, it's actually displayed right on the main screen when you're, when you're hooked up to a car that supports mode nine. So like not every car supports mode nine, but it'll come up right here and it'll tell you what the VIN number is. It'll tell you the ECM calibration number. And it will also tell you what the OBD2 protocol is, whether it's CAN, ISO 94, uh, 9141, maybe J250, that will come up right there. Okay. What about this mode 10 permanent trouble codes? It is available. Again, it's under the same codes tab. So that one codes icon does that one. It does this one and it does mode seven as well. So anything about codes is in there. So this little tool can, can do a lot. I just haven't found that it does mode eight. All right, so moving right along then. Um, what about uh, mode five? Well, mode five actually, if you hooked up to a new car, let's say something 2015 or newer, even, even 2010 or newer, you're probably, you're probably not going to find, um, you're probably not going to find a mode five on there. Um, mode five was used on cars that were older that had oxygen sensors. In the early 2000s, we switched away from oxygen sensors and we switched over from O2 sensors, we switched over to air fuel ratio sensors. Now, externally, they look about the same. Some have a few more wires on them, but they look about the same, but the air fuel ratio sensor um, didn't necessitate having this mode five data and its data gets thrown into mode six. So anyways, what did I do here? I took my old Snap-on red brick scanner and I hooked it to an older car and you can see here on my screen um, where I requested mode five information. It doesn't say mode five, but there it is right there, uh, O2 monitors. And uh, what I can do is look at what's going on with the O2 sensors or uh, what, you know, what's their um, test results because the computer is self-testing these sensors all the time. So. It's related to the O2 sensor heater monitor, uh, the O2 sensor re response time. So under this mode, that's where I would get all that data on the O2 sensors. And it was a handy mode. It would give you a lot of information there to help you determine if the O2 sensor was, was good or if it was bad or if it was getting close to, to needing replacement. Maybe occasionally it would set a code, but not all the time. So you look at the car and you maybe have an O2 code that's pending, but not fully set. So it was useful. You're not likely to see mode five on a newer car. Okay, so we'll clear that out and keep rolling. Oh, there's a shot of the screen where it tells me some of that O2 sensor information. So bank one, sensor one, it tells me the response time, bank one, sensor two, uh, bank two sensor one. And if I kept scrolling, cause this was off of a V8 engine, it would tell me my bank two sensor two as well. Um, and tell me the response time of all those guys. All right. So mode six. And so here is on our little scanner, if we had mode five 
and we had mode six support on our car, we would find it in this non-continuous monitors because the computer doesn't test its oxygen sensors all the time. It also doesn't test its catalytic converter all the time or the EGR valve or the EVAP system. A lot of those emission control devices, right? We have a self-test get done on those. We call that self-test a monitor because that test is not happening all the time. It's a non-continuous monitor. So this is where we would find mode five. So I'll put a dollar sign five right there or a six. That's where we'd find those modes. So if I click this thing, if I, for example, take the catalyst monitor, let me talk a little bit about the, how, how the catalyst monitor works. Uh, we put on OB2 vehicles, we would put an O2 sensor, of course, in front of the catalytic converter, which we started doing that way back in the 80s. Um, and then we put an O2 sensor after the catalytic converter. And uh, uh, interesting thing about catalytic converters is one of the precious metals in them is designed to store oxygen to help the catalytic converter burn up the vehicle's emissions. Real simply, whatever emissions your engine produces, the job of the cat is to try to burn that all up. So what's coming out from the cat is, has a lot less emissions, has a lot less hydrocarbons and CO and oxides and nitrogen. So the catalytic converter is kind of like a big band-aid to uh, clean up the engine. So if your engine's running poorly, that's going to burn up the catalytic converter really quickly. Um, well, to burn things up, we need to store some oxygen in that cat. And we do that with the precious metal called cerium. Um, there's also in there, there's platinum, there's palladium, there's rhodium inside a cat. This is why the catalytic converter thieves come in the night and steal cats off cars, which drives me crazy. Um, but um, that's why is because those, those metals inside a catalytic converter are very valuable and they do an amazing job at lowering the emissions. Well, what the cat monitor does is it monitors the oxygen storage capabilities of the cat, essentially testing the efficiency of the precious metals on the inside. And I should see a fair amount of oxygen in front of the cat Behind the cat, I really shouldn't see much oxygen there because I should be consuming that oxygen. So the computer's looking for this under certain modes where it says, hey, now's a good time to test that uh, catalyst and see what his efficiency is. So that's basically how that monitor works. Let's look at some catalyst efficiency mode six monitor data. Boom, there it is right there on our app. This is on a Toyota product. Uh, early 2000s. And uh, again, what is it looking for? Well, before the catalytic converter, we should see an O2 sensor that's switching back and forth. Rich lean, rich lean, rich lean, rich lean. But after the catalytic converter, it should be relatively smooth because the cat's absorbing the oxygen. So whenever it goes lean, the cat absorbs that and says, thank you, and uses it up. But when the cat loses its ability to store oxygen, then the rear O2 sensor, heck, he starts looking just like the front O2 sensor. And when the computer sees that and realizes, hey, I'm driving nice and smooth down the road, so I met my enable criteria, that's going to set a code. It's going to say, that's not looking good. It failed. So here we have one that failed catalyst monitor. Okay. Uh, the minimum is zero, and we don't know what this is. It's some type, type of computer uh, data where it is, um, uh, well, I guess I should back up a minute here. Uh, manufacturer defined, so we don't know what this monitor ID, this mid one component ID six, we don't know what that stands for. I've just told you it's the catalytic converter, and I'll, I'll tell you how I, I got to that in a minute. But we can see that we recorded a value of 256, which is way above the maximum, All right? Here we have the next um, same component, different test, value of 510, again, way above the maximum. So if, you, if I had something where the maximum was 17 and it passed, but it passed at 16, I could say, well, I'm passing 
but I'm really close to failing. Right. This one's way bad because it's, it's way over the maximum amount. So now this is a good spot for me to back up for a minute. And how do I know what these things are? Well, my generic OBD2 scanner is not going to tell me what this mid is or what this SID is. And I, we used to call these instead of monitor ID, I would call it a test ID. Like what test is the computer doing and what component is being tested? So what test is the computer doing? What component is being tested? So we are going to change our screen share real quick. Let's see if I can get that going here. Like this, just trying to clean things up. Okay, new screen share. We're gonna go back to the internet. And uh, what I did here, is uh, sometimes you can get it off a of shop key and all data. But um, what I did is if I go back, I just typed in Toyota mode six. And, you know, I Google searched around a little bit, got to a little uh, chat room club. And through that, somebody had copied the factory repair manual and threw up a PDF of it. And here is that PDF. So this is actually the, the Toyota factory information at that time. Um, and it would tell me what the components are and what the test is. So if I go down here and I'm going down to, uh, let's see, test ID six, what we want is component ID six, so EGR. Um, vacuum, EVAP, okay, catalyst. Um, so what it would tell you is, okay, this is the, you can multiply that by, to get a conversion. Basically it would tell you, okay, TID 01 is for the catalyst, component ID, catalyst bank one versus bank two. So this is a good example of, um, how I could use service information to help me identify what my TIDs and SIDs are, or how I have in the presentation, because they've kind of started changing it, uh, talking about it differently, what my monitor IDs are. So let me make sure I get that screen share switched over, guys. I apologize. It's a little difficult, a little clunky kind of moving back and forth, but... Um, yeah, okay, so that's how I could know what my, um, you know, what am I looking at? What does this mean and what does that mean? Okay, I would have to use service information to do that. All right, so mode six, is it valuable? Yes, it is because it can let you know, oh, okay, I tested a component. Well, how bad was it? Did it pass with flying colors? Did it get an A or did it just barely pass or did it fail and fail by a lot, right? So it's a great one to do. It's also a good when you're validating repairs like you, like you or do, you've done your test drive, you ran that monitor, now you're checking it and okay, it didn't set any pending codes. Well, I could go one step further and not just see, okay, well, I didn't set any pending codes, but I just tested myself. How well did I pass the test? And of course, if we did our repairs right, we would expect our repairs, we'd be down here close to the minimum, right? We'd be down there maybe a zero, one or a two or something like that. We would be close to the low end and not just barely squeaking through. So it's a great way to evaluate your repairs, but it is clunky in that you have to use service information to figure out what you're looking at. The generic scanner is not going to define this stuff for you. And this is where a factory scanner or a professional scanner that can simulate the factory scanner, like a, a Snap-on or an Altel or an OTC, um, could look tell, tell you what this information is directly on the scanner without you looking it up. All right, so that's mode six. Mode seven, we've talked about, right? That's pending codes. And now you can see that, hey, looking at pending codes 
and then uh, mode seven, and then going back to mode six, those two things could be you really used together to give you a good sense on the effectiveness of your repairs. Now we need to talk about mode eight. Now mode eight is one where the idea is we're gonna use the scan tool to control the vehicle somehow. And this is again, what we call, what, what is commonly called in the industry, a bi-directional, Where the, where the scanner's controlling the vehicle. Um, and so here you can see, I got my Solus Ultra and I've hooked up to a late model vehicle that supports mode eight. And uh, it was a gas engine. So the one that I could do was uh, EVAP system leak test. Um, if you hooked up to a late model diesel, you might, might be able to force it to do a regen on the particulate filter. So that's, that's something that you might have on a late model diesel vehicle. So those are the two standard ones that you can do through OBD2. Obviously on a tool like the Solus Ultra, if I went into the manufacturer side of the tool, there'd be a lot more bi-directional controls. Remember that OBD2 is focused on emissions. And so the two it gives us are directly related to emissions if the car supports it at all. And if the tool supports it, our app again doesn't doesn't support it, or at least with the current update that I have, it doesn't support it. Okay. Well, what about mode nine? Hey, our app does do that, and so I actually I need to draw a big line through this because uh, when I first wrote this class, the car scanner app wasn't doing mode nine very well, and uh, then they did an update, and now it does mode nine just fine as long as the vehicle can support mode nine. So on my 96 uh, GMC, uh, it doesn't do mode nine. The vehicle's not smart enough to support it. However, if I hook it up to, you know, I don't know, a 2000, my, another car in the French household is a 2007 Saturn, that's new enough, it's controller area network and it supports mode nine just fine. Um, here's an example of mode nine on the, Solus Ultra on the snap-on right there. And, um, you know, this, this, is a, this is a big one because what it does is it lets you know what the calibration numbers are in the computer and what the VIN number is in the computer. And that's a big deal. I had a, I had a student come in and this was several years ago and his, his car didn't run right. And we were kind of running around trying to figure it out. And he thought it was something with the computer. And I start pulling more information from him because it's, it's a, you know, it's a V8 engine, it was a Camaro, but it was running on six cylinders. I mean, he just had, bad, had a bad misfire. Well, it turns out in his, you know, trying to diagnose it himself with limited knowledge, he was just throwing parts at it. And he went to pick and pull and got a computer for another Camaro that was the same year and put it in his car. But that was a computer for a Camaro with a V6 engine and he had a V8. And so it was the wrong computer in there. But I didn't figure that out until I start looking at it and I realized, hey, the VIN number in the computer doesn't match the VIN number that I'm looking at that's on the dashboard of the car. Um, the other thing that's really valuable is this calibration number. Because sometimes the problem, the, the fix for a car, a modern car, it might not be a hardware issue. It might be a software issue where the fix is to reprogram the computer and that takes care of that cold winter drivability issue or whatever. The other thing I've seen is I've fought cars that they have a hard time running the monitors, they won't pass smog, and it's because somebody has reprogrammed this car for performance, and that reprogram is, is messing up its emissions, and now it won't pass smog because of that. Um, so again, I always check mode nine now to make sure I'm not wasting a lot of time because how, how am I ever going to get the emissions in compliance on a vehicle that's been reprogrammed, right? Or get something run to run correctly when it doesn't have the right computer in the car. So modes, mode nine is pretty powerful. And again, mode nine would be displayed on our little app right here on the app if the car supports it. All right. Well, what about mode 10? Mode 10 is permanent trouble codes. We could look at those codes 
on our little diagnostic trouble codes icon here, what do we find mode 10 on? 2010 and newer vehicles support this feature. These codes cannot be cleared by us as the technician. The only way to, to fix mode 10 codes is to fix the car and then drive it around so that it runs its monitor and tests itself out and clears itself out, okay? So only the computer module itself can clear the codes. No scan tools, whether it's a factory scanner or our inexpensive one can clear mode 10 codes. You have to fix the car and you gotta drive the car. So uh, what's the deal with mode 10? Well, mode 10 really came about because of emissions. We started testing cars and within a few years, uh, you know, the, the guys and gals at the Bureau of Automotive Repair, it, they're pretty smart. And they started realizing that, you know, what folks would do is they would have a problem in their car. They would clear the codes, drive it around just enough to get most of the monitors to run, but not all of them. And then they would just kind of sneak it through smog. And, you know, I know lots of folks, I've had lots of students do that over the years and they're like oh if i if i could just time it just right and so this was a way to kind of make sure that hey if there's something really wrong with the car it really gets identified and it really gets fixed correctly so mode 10 is your pdtc's permanent diagnostic codes they're stored in the long-term memory of the vehicle so even if you disconnect the battery it won't clear the code even if you use the best scanner in the world, it won't clear the code. What you have to do is you can use mode 10 to read the code, but then you actually have to fix the car and drive it out of there. So we'll clear out those scribbles. How does this relate to our smog laws? Well, 2000 and newer cars, well, like if we look at like how many monitors need to run, what, one of the things I guess I should take two steps back is if you're going to get smogged, right? If you're going to go get your car smogged in its OBD2 uh, vehicle, well, it needs to run most all the monitors, meaning that the computer needs to have tested out all its various systems. So there's all kinds of monitors, right? There's monitors for the oxygen sensors. There's monitors for the catalytic converter. There's monitors for misfires. Well, on a 96 or, or newer car, 96 to 99, I should say, I can have any one monitor hasn't ran. And you know, if, if I have six monitors and five of them have run, I'm good, okay? I can pass smog. If I'm a 2000 or newer, I can have it where it's ran all the monitors except for EVAP and it will still pass smog. Um, if it's a 2010 uh, or newer car, well, that still holds true, but now we have permanent DTCs there. So if there's a problem, um, you know, it's, it's going to catch it and you're going to have to really fix the car. So the idea was, is that this mode 10 helped tighten up the emissions compliance of the vehicle for the life of the vehicle. And it was something that the uh, smog machines can access pretty easily. And so can our um, generic scanners. So here's a good example of one that's a failure on mode 10 here. So we have a car that has a permanent. So this is the vehicle inspection report is what they call it. And it says, hey, this thing fails. Um, it gives you some information, passed visually, but the functional test failed because, oh, guess what? We have a P0456 EVAP, very small leak, and it's a permanent DTC. So guess what? We're going to have to, we're going to have to get that thing, uh, get that thing fixed. Or there is a provision because, you know, they started doing this. It, it turned into a nightmare really fast. So what they said is, all right it's supposed to be fixed, but some cars are just, it's really hard to get them to run the monitor and to clear the code, right? And we've already talked about enable criteria. 
the conditions necessary. I'm going to type it out again. Got some stuff on my keyboard here. Enable criteria. It's your conditions necessary to get the monitor to run. So depending upon your driving habits and commute and roads that you go on, you might not ever meet the enable criteria. Well, if I don't meet the criteria, guess what? The, the code's not going to, code's not going to run, right? The monitor's not going to run, then I'm not going to clear the code, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So if I don't meet this, I can't run the monitor. I can't clear out the PDTC. So is it always going to be a smog failure? No, because... If you've driven it around enough through 15 warm-up cycles and accumulated at least 200 miles from when the codes were cleared, the smog machine will pass it in, in our state, in the state of California. So they put that provision in the programming of the machine. So if somebody just, they never drive it the right way, they never meet that enable criteria. If they drive it around enough, it, it'll pass smog. And that's how they solve the issue for some cars that are just really hard to get it to run event monitor, that type of thing. Okay. So now you know about all the modes of OBD2. We've done mode, you know, one through 10, right? 10 is permanent data trouble codes. Mode one is looking at your data stream, right? Everything between reading codes, clearing codes, freeze frame, and there is a lot of power in those modes. Our conclusions from this, of course, is that, hey, you know what? As cars have evolved, so is OBD2, right? When I look at, you know, this 1996 Camry, it's a lot different than a, you know, 2020 Camry right here, right? So it makes sense that the onboard diagnostic system has evolved, right? You don't get all 10 modes of OBD2 on that 96, but you'll get, you know, most all of them except for mode five, because that car is using air fuel ratio sensors, not O2 sensors um, uh, before the cat. Anyways, um, uh, you'll get those modes on that newer car. So good diagnostic can be done on modes one through four. And then those modes one through four are then supplemented with extra information, six, seven, eight, and nine, right? And if you can use all those modes and leverage all that information, like, oh, I'm gonna check for pending codes. Oh, now I'm gonna look at my mode six data, or I'm gonna use mode eight to help me control the car so I can find that EVAP leak. If you could use all 10 of these modes effectively, you'll be able to do a lot more than a lot of folks that are out there working in the industry and, uh, you know, quite frankly, that's, um, that's what it's all about, right? That's what we're trying to do is get you to be a power user of OBD2. That's uh, what the kids would say is, is big brain, if you will, like you're using all the facets of that tool. So that's our presentation for tonight. We have now talked about all 10 modes of OBD2. Most of the time we're running in modes one through four, um, but there's lots of stuff Lots of stuff in there for, uh, for us to use and diagnose, even on the generic side of the, of the scanner. So what I wanna do now is I wanna switch this back to our uh, Canvas page. And let's, we can close out that mode six stuff. We don't need that. Close out this. Um, and here is our Canvas page. And I want to look at our assignments of uh, what's coming up, uh, what was due, and then you know what's coming up next. And so one way to, for me to do that is to look at the course calendar. And what you can see is here we are today. It's October 6th, right? Definitely we're feeling fall settle in here. Um, what was due here on Monday was uh, we had a quiz and we had a question on what diagnostics do you, you need? 
And I'm gonna, we're gonna look at this one. And I think we're gonna extend that one out for you because for whatever reason, it seems like it's hard to find on Canvas. What do we have uh, coming up? Um, coming up in our in our class? Well, in a couple weeks, we have another quiz to do, and we'll be uh, jumping and doing some codes and different things. But uh, you know, I want to make sure that you guys have done lab quiz number two and did this um, diagnostics activity. So let me clear out those scribbles. Let's, we'll go back to our course now. And there's a couple different ways to get there. Um, if you go through the modules, we, we've obviously gone through the syllabus. We've gone through the beginning stuff. And actually tonight, we just switched over from our beginning weeks to our core. So we just, tonight we talked about the modes of OBD2. There's a copy of that uh, uh, presentation right there, um, a, a link to it. Um, and you can see, um, you know, the different lab quizzes and different things. Uh, if I scroll down, if I get it out of uh, drawing mode here, um, there was a couple assignments that I was hoping folks would uh, jump on, uh, jump on and do. And, um, and that is getting used to normal data. I only had a few folks do that. And then what diagnostics do you need? And this one, I wanted to extend it because I can see it right here and I can do it. But if I go to discussions, guess what? It's, it's not there. And I spent an hour today trying to figure out why it's not there. And I don't know why it's not there. But if I go to modules and I'm cruising through here, um, boom, right? What diagnostics do you need? Also, if I go to assignments, I can look on the dates. What diagnostics do you need? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna click that thing. We're gonna check out this assignment. And the idea is that now you have your scanners, you should be pulling some codes, um, you know, and, and I want this class to be real for you guys. And I'm betting that you guys have some cars with some problems. So what I want you to do is pull some information and, you know, how's the car running? Is it, what, is it running good? Is it, does it have a complaint? If, does it have any codes? Pull the data, pull the freeze frame. You know, what do you want to know about? So maybe you have a car that doesn't have anything wrong with it, but you, you know, you want to know something about something. Um, uh, you know, the idea with this is to give us some information. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the student view. We're going to edit this assignment. And I'll push them back another week for you guys. So you have a little bit more time to get it done. And I want to show you, we had a couple folks do it. And uh, G here, if I can find him, he did an excellent, excellent job. So I'm going to pick on you a little bit, but really good job. So um, uh, 91 Camaro, and then we got the Nissan and he goes into the codes and how it's running and that type of stuff. And what does he want to know? Excellent, excellent work here. So, so let's let's pick on this real fast, okay? Um, Ninety one Camaro. Use the so it's it's not OBD two, but I want to show you how I can still build on a lot of the diagnostics we're talking about. So we got a code twenty two and a code thirty three and a code forty five. I'm going to just pick on the first one tonight, the code twenty two. Um, and notice that they're you know, different codes because they're not, it's not an OBD2 car. So how would I do this? Well, if I, I got to get out of here for a minute. Get out of there. Um, to go back to here. There we go. Go to modules. 
Um, remember that uh, I put on there how to um, how to get on ShopKey Pro, and I gave you guys our logins and stuff for ShopKey on our website. So I've logged in the ShopKey. Uh, I put in that vehicle and I guessed on some of the stuff. But anyways, if I go to OneSearch Plus, I typed in a code 22. Then I went to OEM testing. I, I again had to, um, uh, you know, go through there. I know it's for the throttle position sensor low. I believe it's a five liter car. And here's what it gives me. Now, what I like about this is that it tells me a little bit about how the sensor works. And I've always, you know, appreciated that part of shop key or Mitchell on demand. So it tells me how the sensor works. So voltage should increase gradually to about four and a half volts at a steady rate as the throttle is increased. It doesn't tell me everything. Like normally it's about a half a volt when the throttle is closed, four and a half volts at wide open throttle. It does give me a wiring diagram, a simplified wiring diagram in there. So this is a potentiometer sensor. Um, shows me how it's wired up in the computer and how it gets its signal and it gets five volt reference. There's the ground. This is a, a physical sensor where we have contact between this wiper arm. And uh, anyways, what these guys would do oftentimes, because we're normally driving around at like quarter throttle, is it would wear a flat spot in the sensor at the bottom of its range. And you would get a hesitation on acceleration. So with all these uh, diagnostic case studies, what I recommend you do is, is look up the diagram, look up the, the theory of operation of how it works, uh, just like we're doing right here, and do a little research, do some legwork on how, how that sensor works. It also gives us a flow chart. Let's look at this thing. It, it tells us here's the wire colors. Um, let's look at the factory flow chart. And you know, GM was famous for this, but every manufacturer will have some type of flow chart. This is their diagnostic procedure, right? So with the throttle fully closed, is it greater than 0.2 volts? Yes, go down this way. No, go that way. Yes, it is. Then it says, okay, disconnect jumper, the five volt signal. Uh, five volt signals, is it greater than this? Greater than four volts? No, replace TPS. No, actually, this, see, so this is where stuff kind of drives us, uh, drives us nuts. Um, this factory flow chart is messed up. <laughs> uh, so if I jumpered the five volt reference, uh, to the TPS signal, uh, I should see greater than four volts. Uh, so this should say yes. If it says yes, it'd be replaced TPS. So I guess I guess there's still no um, there's no substitute for knowing how the circuit should work. But the idea is that you could go through the flow chart, and that flow chart in theory should help you figure out what's wrong with this thing. So if I change that word to yes, rather than no, that would fix this. In fact, I'm gonna do that. Okay. Uh, no, then it wants you to go down there and hook a test light up to it, put a little load on the computer circuit. Um, uh, five volt reference, shorted to ground, faulty ECM signal circuit shorter to ground. So, so then, then the flow chart works out a little bit better. So anyways, with the flow chart information, then you could go and basically this is where we're doing our pinpoint tests, guys. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example of how, you know, you can look up the code and kind of get yourself a direction, at least some information on how the circuit works and what's a direction I could go through this thing on as far as pinpoint testing. Obviously you can tell that it doesn't tell you everything and even some of the flow chart information was flawed. Um, and so it doesn't replace the engine performance class, if you will. That's why we teach that class and it's you know a, a big class right now, it's a six unit class. And um, so you know that's, that's why we do it that way. 
but this gets you go in the direct the hopefully the right direction and then paired with your circuit knowledge you should be able to figure your way out so we'll i'll spend some more time researching those codes on your cars and we'll do we'll do a better job kind of working them in to some case studies later on in our class i encourage all of you guys to um you know do this activity what diagnostics do you need scan some cars with some problems um and then send that stuff over to me so we can start figuring stuff out because that's where this class really gets fun i think for you guys and allows you to use your scanners and really and really test test out your skills um and if you're doing this you can you you could even look at some of this information that we looked at tonight on the throttle position sensor and it's still open so if you want to go back and do that little activity of normal data you can use that information that we looked up to make a posting about the throttle position sensor, if you will, or a crank sensor or something like that. Um, the idea with this activity was to get you guys to do a little research on the various sensors uh, so that you can then look at this big discussion list and, and learn about all the different sensors that you'd find on a fuel injected vehicle. So, all right. Um, so that is what I had for you tonight. Uh, my, uh, my tech tip uh, for you then is, hey, use mode six in conjunction with your uh, test drive and verifying your repairs to really see how well those repairs went and, and how well not did that thing just not set a code. If it doesn't set a code, we know it passed its monitor but how well did it pass its monitor? Um, so that's that's what I had for you tonight. We'll take next week off and we'll we'll come back uh, after that, and and we're gonna go into some more power user features of OBD2. We'll be working in more case studies and kind of taking stuff up to the to the next level. Um, we'll be phasing in like oxygen sensor diagnostics and fuel trim. And um, our very last session, uh, we're basically we're going to have six, um, uh, maybe seven, but but likely we're going to have at least six Zoom sessions. And on that sixth one, we're really diving into nothing but case studies, uh, figuring out what's what's wrong with cars and stuff. So um, hopefully you guys can uh, participate in uh, in all of those. So before I let you go, does anybody have uh, any questions for me that they want me to go over? Um, obviously, with with G's car, like there's he had multiple cars with more multiple codes. We're gonna have to do a little bit more research and and kind of put together a heading on that. Um, but anything else, anything basic, just doing stuff in the class. None of the assignments are set up to lock you out. So if you missed one from a couple of weeks ago, yeah, you you might lose a, a point or two doing it late. But I would still say do it, do it late um, and get it done. Um, let me just point out two more things for you guys. Um, if I scroll to the bottom, you can see all that. Uh, let me make sure I'm in student mode. Let me just make sure this is going to work right for you. Yep, student mode there. So if I scroll to the bottom, you can see that I have uh, some of that snap on training loaded up special for you guys in this class uh, so you guys can start playing around on the snap-on scanner and you're welcome to to set a time and come by and play with the scanners at the at the college if you want to start using the snap-on scanner and comparing that to your little obd2 generic interface um, or if you're in another automotive class by all means check out one of those solo ultras and work that into your activities so you could you could kill you know, two, two assignments and one course, right? So, um, so all that stuff is open and ready for you guys to do. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's some extra credit work that you could do on uh, CDX that I think is, is pretty valuable. So I encourage you guys to check that stuff out uh, and it will definitely help you be more confident with scanner diagnostics. So with that, that's all I had. Thank you guys for hanging out and we will see you guys in a couple weeks. All right. All right. Let me check the chat one last time. Okay. Thank you.
Take care, everybody. Bye for now.